Good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome to Autokeratology Case Study Level 1, the second webinar co-organized by Nian Polytechnic and Medicon Academy. My name is Corinne, a lecturer from the School of Health Sciences, Nian Polytechnic, and I will be the moderators for today's webinar. We are very happy to have over 600 colleagues from various countries joining us in this session. The two co-organizers of today's webinar are Nian Polytechnic, a leading institute of higher learning in Singapore that offers a diploma in optometry by its School of Health Sciences, and Manicon Academy, an initiative by Manicon Singapore to improve the skills and expertise of our fellow eye care practitioners. In our previous webinar, our speaker, Mr. Zendersberg, has pro provided us with insights, insightful tips on corneal topography measurements. For today, Zender will continue to guide us into the world of autokeratology with some practical tips. Before we start the session proper, please allow me to provide you with some housekeeping rules for the webinar. Please take note that all participants will be mute during the presentation. Please use the question tab to send us your questions. We will compile and invite our speaker to answer them at the end of the lecture. You will also need to fulfill a minimum of 75% completion of all the following criteria to be awarded the E certificate of particip participation for this session. You need to be present for the total duration of the webinar. You need to respond to the poll questions through the webinar. And you also need to complete the quiz question in the link provided after the webinar session. The link to the Feedback form of the webinar will be sent to all participants via email after this session. Link to the webinar quiz will be provided upon the submission of the feedback forms. Qualifying participants will receive the e-certification in about two weeks' time upon the submission of your quiz answer. So now please allow me to go on and introduce our speaker of the day to everyone. Our speaker for today, Mr. Zenderster, is an optometrist. Based in the Netherlands, he started his optical career in 1995 and graduated in 2005 with a Bachelor of Science in Optometry. Zander has worked in several big contact lens practice in the Netherlands, where he specialized in autokeratology. Currently, Zander is working for Manicorn Netherlands and is closely involved in the development of new contact lenses. He is also responsible for conducting trainings and workshops. Till date, Zender continues to fit contact lenses in practice, and this contributes greatly to his very practical and insightful lectures. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome our speaker for the day, Mr. Zender Stuck. Zender, please. Thank you, Corinne. Well, thank you, Corinne. Uh, welcome, everyone. First of all, let me share you my screen. Um, here we go. Okay. And today, we start to talk about orthokeratology. So if you look two weeks ago, we discussed a lot about uh, corneal topography, and I will refer back to that lecture, as well, sometimes in this lecture as well. So um, if you follow that lecture, again, welcome back. Uh, and if you didn't follow that lecture, not a problem at all. I will explain a bit what I mean uh, uh, two weeks ago then by these slides. Um, for today, we start about orthokeratology and case studies level one. Well, is there a level one? Is there a level two? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, but what I like to do today is um, to give, um, uh, well, a, a, an in-depth uh, view how I personally approach ortho K cases. So uh, my goal is to make it very hands-on hands -on, uh, um, a webinar uh, with tips and tricks which you can use tomorrow in your practice as well. There's only one side note. We have to discuss some, some, some theory here uh, before we understand what we are doing. So um, the first maybe 15 or 20 minutes, I will uh, really ask for your, for your attention and for your concentration, because I like to explain a bit where, why we are doing things and why do I things. Um, and and um, it's quite complicated, honestly, to, to explain. So I will do my best, but because it is a webinar, I don't see the faces of you guys at the other side of, uh, of the screen. So um, if for me, it's hard if, if someone get it, yes or no. So I will do hardly my best to explain what I mean. And at well, after the 20 minutes, I guess you get it. 
I hope. Uh, and then you understand completely where I'm coming from. And the beauty of it is, I think, in my opinion, um, it makes your world a lot easier. Because um, what I found is, um, and, and because I give a lot of support for, for ortho K cases as well here in the Netherlands, um, uh, that a lot of people are struggling. Uh, they don't know exactly what they are looking at, made the wrong mistakes. Uh, and um, uh, in, in fact, we make it maybe too overcomplicated altogether. Uh, and in fact, it is quite simple, but we have to back to the basis, basics. So that's what I want to cover today, that at the end of this session, we have a clear understanding uh, what we are actually doing in practice and probably hands-on tips you can use tomorrow right away. Yeah. Uh, so, but before we start, before we start with all these kind of things, um, I like to start with a poll. On the left side, you will see a topo map and on the right side you will see uh, the, the well the, the questions what it is is it uh, answer a is the bullseye what you see or is it b is it central island is c is kind of smiley face or well are you honest and and and, and you say okay but uh, honestly i don't know it, it, it's fair enough to say that as well so that's the question if you look to this image what will the, your choice will be so i give you a couple of seconds and i shut my mouth so uh, we have a uh, see now full screen and uh, in a couple of uh, 10, 10 seconds, I will pull up the poll. So I will launch the poll right now. So uh, let your answers going. Uh, I will wait for. Uh, I will close the poll right now. What are the results of this poll? In my opinion, the correct answer is D, you don't know. And this is where it, a lot of mistakes are made. Um, people um, are already see by one image, okay, well, this is, this is what it is. But in fact, you don't know. And the reason is you have to always use two, two, two differential maps. And that's very important. And I uh, referred to that already uh, two weeks ago during the webinar of, about corneal topography. But let me get the slides back to, to explain you a bit. Because we, we mentioned the sagittal map and the sagittal map um, is something what uh, relate everything to the center area of the cornea. What gives us a, a, a good, it was this kind of power map and what gives you us a very good information, clear information, what is happening in the center area of the cornea. So uh, this is one part um, uh, what we need for uh, for our total examination of of of, um, 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 of the top of the ortho K fit. The other side is the tangential map. I mentioned that two weeks ago before uh, as well. We have a tangential map. Nothing is related to the center um, uh, to the center area of the cornea. So we can very localize. We can have a very good good view, a very clear vision, what is actually happening in the periphery of the cornea. And that's a very important thing. So both maps is something we use to have a final examination. So first of all, we need uh, what, is, what is the lens fit in the center, or what is the lens fit in the periphery, and those maps, those answers together gives us the final the final answer. So only based on one map and say, oh, this is a central island, or this is a smiley face, or this is a bullseye, you actually don't know. And it, it, it was a bit of misleading questions. I, I know you probably at the other side of, of the screen, you are a bit angry on, on me right now. But um, uh, and honestly, I don't care. But um, uh, it is um, uh, it, the fact is, um, this is what we see happening a lot of time in, the, in practice only a response is made seen by one image no it's you cannot trust it you have to make two separate differential maps and that's what we do so and why and and i made a couple of slides especially for you guys uh and so so what you can make print screens of because i think that's very handy to use in your practice so i go to now to my next slide and don't make a print screen yet uh but I make it blue and I make it red. And, and that that's correlates with the colors you have to focus on in your topo map. So if you lo look to the sagittal map and the axial map, you focus on the central shapes. That map is telling you something about the central shapes. Uh, we call that the optical zone, the treatment zone, it's different names, but it is the, the center area of the fit. 
If we look to the right, uh, the, sorry, the red, the red, uh, um, the, the tangential map, we're going to the, look into the red part of the image. So we're going to look to local shapes, more in the periphery, uh, and we look uh, more for the centration of the lens. And uh, let me shut down my camera so you can make a, a, a good print screen of this, because um, I think it's a quite interesting slide. It, it's just the colors tells you already where you look, have to look at uh, in, in each topo map. Um, um, let me explain, and this now it becomes a bit more, a bit, a bit more complicated. Now, um, let me explain a bit more how, why we do, are doing things, and, and let me pull back this, this, this image I showed in my webinar two weeks ago. I explained a bit already about um, um, the, the way a lens is built, and we have a central area, we have an alignment zone, and we have an edge zone. In, in, in a very rough way, this is how a lens is designed. These several parts. It, everything goes about alignment zone. Alignment zone is responsible for the fit. And if you relate that to ortho K, um, we have to control the fit if we want to make the system predictable. So um, uh, if we don't control the fit, the lens will sit everywhere. And because in ortho K we work with a kind of pressure difference, uh, the, the most strange things will happen, will occur. So uh, the main reason, and that's why I show, show up the screen as well, is that we have it's very important that we control the alignment zone. But if, if that, I hope you guys all agree with that. That's, that's where the starting point is. So if you understand that, it, it makes really no sense to fit lenses, and especially ortho K lenses, on central K readings, if you want to fit in the periphery correctly, because that's the most important part. In fact, that's where our fit starts. Every contact lens fits, but especially with ortho K, because we need the center area for power shift and not for a fit. We need the periphery for the fit. So if you understand that, looking to, to topo maps, um, we have to think about different about, um, um, about contact lenses and about designs. And um, let me explain it a bit. This is the kind of terminology you are not familiar with, uh, because um, uh, we talk about link systems and we talk about unlinked systems. And that's quite new. I can assume that you never heard about this terminology uh, before. And why? Probably because uh, it is uh, common that um, uh, no one uh, uses it before. Um, I, well, I, we as a company uh, try to uh, explain by this terminology what we're actually doing with lenses. And um, um, maybe this, this kind of terminology will change over time because if other uh, manufacturers or other uh, brands will, will come up or scientific, scientists will say, okay, this is, this is um, something we have to embrace and they already do in the Netherlands, by the way, but uh, they, the, 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 the names will maybe change over time. But again, we have link systems and unlinked systems. And this is very crucial to understand. What do I mean exactly with a link system? In a link system, and I go. Let me go back to 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 the to, to the previous slide. Um, we have the optical zone and we have the alignment zone. If that part is linked, you can imagine that when you change the base curve of the lens, the periphery will change as well. So that's why, why, why what makes sometimes these lenses are hard to fit because um, if you have a, a, stu, a, st a steep fit in the center and you have a flat fit uh, in a GP lens in the periphery, what are you gonna do? If you're gonna steepen the lens for the periphery, you make it only more steeper for the center area. And if you flatten it, you have a problem in the periphery. So a link system is quite hard. So adjustments in the center affect the periphery and vice versa. If you, when you have an unlinked system, then we unlinked the periphery and, and, the, and the optical zone, so we can adjust it independently. We can adjust this thing uh, separately from that thing, so we have more, much more freedom. If we go to a link system, they mostly based on base curves and eccentricity. So at tomorrow, if you fit a new ortho K lens, and you use uh, an ortho K lens based on base curves, with all respect, you're working with a kind of link system. If you work with a lens on eccentricity, well, and I'm not a, a big fan of eccentricities at all, of E-values, um, uh, for from a fitting perspective. And uh, one short thing is, um, people think that they have freedom in the periphery, but uh, imagine this, if we talk about an E-value of 0.4 or 0.6 or 0.8, what, what kind of E-value you take for your lens? Um, where is the E-value related to? 
yes, again to your base curve. So you have a certain base curve with an E value of this. So again, we're still discussing linked systems. If we go to unlinked systems, we only rely on peripheral data. So in fact, the start, the fit will start in the periphery and we work our, our, our way back to the center. That's where we actually started. The fit will happen in the periphery in every lens, soft lenses, rigid lenses, ortho K lenses, scleral lenses, every lens will fit in the periphery. And so this is your, your, your most concern in the first place and you work your way back to the center. If you have a lens based on base curve, you start in the center and you're assuming something for in the periphery. It's, it's the opposite. So, um, um, and because we are using topographers, we um, um, have, we know much more information about the periphery. So this is why we can use unlinked systems. And if I can say a brand name, and I'm not, I don't know, not really sure if I'm allowed to, but the C9, for instance, is an unlinked system based on peripheral data. And um, that's why we you can only fit it by topographer. We need the peripheral data because that's where actually we, where we make the fit, and then we work, the, work our way back to the center. So, in fact, the in result, this will give you a limited freedom, fitting freedom, what you can do with the lens. One, one change will affect always the other. And in the case of unlinked systems, and that's why I'm a big fan of unlinked systems, um, you have, as a specialist, as a practitioner, you have complete freedom and everything starts to become logical. So it sounds very complicated, but in fact, we can have more, a better, a better, uh, um, uh, better our final result. That's what we see with unlinked systems in general, that we, in, in ortho K lenses, that we have much better centrations and that we have uh, a larger optical zones or treatment zones. That's because we have more control about the fit because our starting point is on a different position uh, in relation to base curve designs. Well, why is it important? Because a lot of people uh, mention to me, but, but Sander, um, um, I'm quite successful with base curve lenses as well. Um, if probably you, if it is successful with base curve, probably you will have even a better result when you go to an unlinked system. So it is an add-on. Let me, it's the way he, how we approach uh, in lenses our practices. And uh, well, again, let me an example do what we do in the Netherlands, but probably overseas you will do it that, that way as well. Um, let's say soft disposable lenses. Um, actually, every soft lenses, we, we, in, in what we learned at school, we want movement of a soft lenses. If we look at the most of the disposable lenses, the, the movement, well, is not that much. But we all agree because the, the patient is not complaining and, and it's going well and we, we think it is okay. The point is, um, on the other hand, 50% of all the people who start with soft lenses are in one year dropouts. So even if we think it is acceptable, in fact, we are missing a lot because 50% is dropouts. So maybe we have to approach our, our, our way of thinking and that's why I try to make this so clear. Um, Unlinked systems give you, you can have a good result with base, with base curves, but probably will even better with an unlinked system. And I think you have to give your patient always the best and the, the, the best result. So that's why I want to point out. Let me explain it more in detail. So if we have a kind of ortho K lens, and this is a very schematical, very schematical uh, image, but it, it, everything with an ortho K lens is, yeah, it depends on the backside of the lens. So we forgot the front side of the lens, it's about the inside of the lens, uh, of the backside of the lens. That's where the magic happens. And at the moment we have an unlinked system, we can adjust, let's say the periphery separately from the center. So if we have the fit in the periphery perfect, then we are done with our fit. We can concentrate just about the center of the lens and we can adjust it manually without affecting the periphery. So it makes our fitting um, life, our, our, the way we fit, much uh, easier and, and, and uh, much better to understand. Even unlinked systems at the moment probably is something new for you and uh, maybe sounds complicated, but in fact, it is helping us as specialists. Uh, our life is, will be coming easier. Um, 
this again, this is very schematical. These are the reverse curve, and that's where we where we where we combine those two zones together, and we, we what gives us, us us the freedom. So, in fact, if we look to an ortho K fit, we have uh, to deal with the reverse curve. That that's the part, in fact, what, what connecting the zones, the peripheral zone and the optical zone. That's what we do in the reverse curve, and how we do it. I mean, that that that's a secret, best keep secret, uh, uh, honestly. Uh, the center area we can play with the height, but we can play with the the, the, the base curve, and the base curve is uh, determining how many power uh, correction do, do we do we give, and we have to deal with the uh, uh, alignment zone, and that's responsible for the fit. And in fact, this is where it starts. If we don't control the alignment zone, we have no control about the lens fit at all. So um, um, if we don't have a good centration or a good a good al the alignment zone is on the correct spot then um, uh, we w won't end up with a good result with ortho K. So that's, that's where I, our first focus has to be on the alignment zone. So let's say, and now there is another term, term what i like to introduce to you. Uh, let's say, okay, we have to deal with the point of touch. And that's, that's a term uh, I mentioned already when I was in Singapore, but um, um, maybe it's, you're not familiar with it. Let me explain it. The point of touch is it, it, it's just saying the the, the, the area where the lens hits actually the cornea. And well, for very critical species here, but, but a lens is always uh, uh, moving in the tear layer. Well, okay. Um, where the back side of the lens and the front side of the cornea is the thinnest. Yeah, that's the place where, 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 where the, 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 the tear layer is the smallest. And that's what we call the point of touch. And why is that important? Why is that important? Well, it, 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 well let me explain it like this. Let's say we give a sagittal height of a lens. We, we, we are aiming for a specific sagittal height. Um, let's say, okay, we, we are aiming for a kind of specific sagittal height. And we are aiming for a, a distance in, in the center area of, from, the, from the back side of the lens and the front side of the cornea around 10 microns. Uh, why we want to play in the safe zone? We don't want that, that, that number, that, 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 that that uh, um, uh, distance smaller because of um, uh, touch of the cornea, we get staining with ortho K. I mean, we don't want to go there. So, but we want to control the point of touch. In fact, that is our, that is our fit. So if we control the point of touch, we control our lens fit. So, um, um, only using the sexual height, and uh, it, let's say, okay, that, that's important for lens, but if we don't control the point of touch, is it differently? We can put several parameters in the lens, but if we don't control the point of touch, um, everything is going to happen. We we not fully control the, sit the situation. And now, now I go back to the story. That's why we have to look in the sagittal map only for the center area. And in the tangential map, we're looking for the height. That's what we are looking for. But in the tangential map, we are looking for the point of touch. And in fact, we see we are looking to, to the red circle, and that is a representation of the reverse curve. But the location of that tells us, in fact, where um, uh, the point of touch is. The point of touch is next to it. So this is what we're actually doing when we're looking to topo maps. And I want to, and I will shut down my camera so you can make a print screen of this as well, uh, without my face in, in 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 the screen. So this is, to me, is a quite important slide because this is where you focus on. Sagittal map, you're looking for, let's say, the height, and in tangential map, you're looking for the point of touch. And if we have that, um, then I have a next slide for you. And uh, let's say, okay, in the sagittal and axial map, we are looking for the height, in the tangential map, we're looking for the point of touch. So in case, if we talk about a bullseye, is we discuss a bullseye, uh, then we have we, we say, okay, the, the fit is perfect, the fit is okay, so the height is correct, and the point of touch is where it should be. So both of things are perfect. If we then discuss a central island, we talk about a steep fit then, so you have problems is are in the height, and not at the point of touch, because the lens, play, the, the centration of the lens will be okay, but the height will be too high, the fit is too steep. That being said, over oh, and let's discuss for a moment overcomplicated things. In fact, if we discuss a central height, we talk about a steep fit. Why are we using the terminology of central island then? Think about it. If we have a good fit, if we fit normal GP lenses or sclera lenses, or we fit soft lenses, if we have a good fit, we call it a good fit. No, in case of ortho K, we call a good fit in bullseye. 
we overcomplicate things. It is, it is, it is strange. It is, um, uh, it, it makes things unnecessarily complex. And in case of a smiley face, and that's why I make it red, the problem is in the point of touch. And because the point of touch is not where we're aiming, where, where, where we want and want to have it, um, we, it will finally result in, in, in problems here as well. This being said, and let me shut down uh, my camera so you can make a print screen of this as well. And I make the, the things I tried to explain already for 20 minutes uh, um, um, make, yeah, well, make, make a bit sense. Um, this is where it, where it goes. This is what it is. It is not more complicated than this. And now you know where we're coming from. So in case, when you, you're looking for, for your uh, topo map, you look to the sagittal map, you say, hmm, I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the, the treatment zone is, is, not, is, not what, is not what I like, it's not, not perfectly. But you, see all, you also see, uh, see encounter problems with your point of touch, encountering the tangential map, that's okay, the centration is a bit off as well. Um, always, no exception, always first adjust the, the periphery. Always make sure your fit is perfect, because if you have your fit perfect, your center area is more reliable as well. So at the moment, your tangential map is off, is not the, the way you like it, first make sure that one, it, it, you, that, that one first make sure you, you, you solve that issue uh, before, before you do something else. And that may be to another point. Um, and I, I don't know how it's coming. We uh, learning people that way as well, because everyone else in the world is doing that. But if you understand this, that, that the fit starts in the periphery, in the alignment zone, you can imagine that the tangential map is more important than the sagittal map. The sagittal map becomes important at the moment the tangible map is correct. So um, um, that's so what everyone is doing is um, um, everyone started with the sagittal map and try to make already some decisions over there and, and well, a bit confusing what you saw in, in my uh, f first poll already, a bit confusing, about, and then they go to the tangential map. But why don't reverse that? Why don't start with the tangential map? Or if you still want to look first to the sagittal map, just do it. But it, it, you start to become confused, skip it, go directly to the tangential map. But most of the time, you will find your answer there. If the tangential map is off, your sagittal map will become everything. Your overfraction will become everything. So let me give you one hands-on tip. Start with your tangential map. Please do it. And of course, uh, from a manufacturer point of view, we are explaining the people for, first to do the sagittal map as well, and then the tangential map, and why everyone else in the world is doing it. And changing that is quite hard. But we are, we are looking with around, uh, well, with a lot of participants, by the way. So maybe we can start a change. And that would be great that we first do tangential maps. And I, with the way I approach it, I hope it makes sense. And I, it makes sense that, that why I'm doing things in practice. Well, that being said, um, that is another thing to make your life easier. To make your life easier. It's, it's full of tips this webinar. I, I, I enjoy it, by the way. Um, and ask yourself the correct questions. And what are the questions uh, you're asking yourself right now? I will come to that. But um, I found that, that in the years I, I did a lot of ortho K um, that I was very confused by some topo maps. That, that, that there was a lot too much going on. And what 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 do I see? And I start using um, uh, two questions to just ignore the rest of what I see. So let me explain this why. This is the example where we started with. This was the poll. This was the poll question. And what do we see? We see a blue spot. We see a red spot, so I can imagine that people say, "Okay, I see. I, I think it's a bullseye because it's built up very beautiful." But people say, "Okay, it is. It is an, uh, a smiley face as well because we see here kind of a smiley effect." It's quite confusing, but understand in which map you are looking, and we are looking to the sagittal map. And we d we discussed already when you're looking for the central uh, sagittal map, you only focus on the central shapes. So what is the, is the question you have to ask yourself, and let me shut down so you can make a print screen, is the treatment zone as expected, yes or no?
And I will explain in a minute what, what you want to expect, but that's the question you have to take. So the treatment zone, you focus on the treatment zone. That's why I make all the sexual things uh, blue uh, instead of red, because you focus yourself on the blue spots. Only focusing on the blue spot. This is noise. This is this is this is noise. This is oh, it is confusing you. Ignore it because you are on the set map. You don't have to, to deal with it. You have only have to deal with it with with the uh, with, with the treatment zone. And the, there are two things what you want in the set map. And one is hard to see. I've later on I have an example what is what easy to see. I will come to that back. But, uh, come back to that. But what you want is if you look here and I shut myself down so it's bigger for you in your screen. You see the way the 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 the, the, the treatment zone is built. It is dark blue. It is with a line lighter blue and light. It becomes from a very cold color more to a warmer color. But it is it is evenly spread. That's a very good sign. That's a very good sign uh, that 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 the treatment zone is actually doing well so th that's one tip another thing is um always look to your initial map and that's what i mentioned two weeks ago with the webinar as well when we look to uh, gp fit what can you expect but that's the same with ortho k if this patient come into your store and and, and asking for ortho k and uh, no matter what what brand you will fit you see and you see a steepening area in the center um you can expect, and this is, this is a rule of thumb, so it's not scientific, it's just a rule of thumb, but it is always, honestly, it, it, you, hands down, it, it is in 999 times of thousands. So you, you really can rely on that. Um, 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 if the superior part for this example is steep, you can expect that your treatment zone is in the direction of the steepest part of your cornea. And I honestly, um, probably there are scientific ways or mathematical ways to explain it, and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, um, I'm an optometrist. I'm a practitioner. I'm just, just like you guys. Um, and probably I could make the time to find out why this is all exactly happening and, and mathematical, blah, blah, blah. I think it's quite boring. It, I see this is happening, and this is what meaning for my patient. So if I have a patient, if I have a patient, these kind of corneas, I know already, even if I uh, the, the power is of minus two or minus three, a very low minus power uh, to correct, um, I know, okay, but the, the treatment zone will be more superior will be not in the center that's a very very uh, common thing so i have to uh, adjust the expectations of my customer so let's say in fact you have to say if you want to answer this question is the treatment zone as expected yes the treatment zone is expected it is built up correctly it is the initial map shows you it is in the superior part steeper so the 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 the, the treatment zone will be decentered as well the, the lens itself acts perfectly it won't say your patient couldn't com couldn't complain because uh, you can imagine that that if we um, imagine okay th this will be the pupil size the black circle um, it is looking half half to the optical zone so it could be that your your patient in um, uh, is complaining about glare and halo it is something you cannot solve because it is just the way it is it is it is what you could expect it before so what I suggest to do is okay. If someone can come into a shop and ask, or, or in your practice, and ask for uh, ortho K lenses, take a moment and look to the initial map and look where the steepening is. And if the steepening is superior, inferior, or, or, or decentered, you know the treatment zone will descend it as well. So you have to ex adjust the expectations of your customer. And that's, that's uh, you can make that these things uh, better beforehand than afterwards. So what I say to this patient, so, well, okay, um, uh, let we will, try definitely um, uh, ortho K, we, we, we can do it probably, not a problem at all, but uh, imagine, or uh, it could be the case that you experience a bit of glare of halo. And if you experience that, it's something I cannot solve. And in fact, what I'm saying to the patient, it's your problem, keep it. That's in fact what I'm basically, in a nice way, what I try to say to the, to the patient. If I don't say to the, to, to the patient, and I say, okay, but we tried, oh, well, your power is uh, perfect for that, and we try it, and you end up with this result, and your patient st start to complain, you have a discussion in your chair, and I try to avoid discussion. If you can do it up beforehand, you are even a more specialist as well. So, um, um, let, me, let, that, let this be a tip, but again, don't become confusing all the of all these colors when you're looking for the surgical map. You're looking only for the treatment zone, what you expected. That's only for the treatment zone. 
At the other hand, if we go, uh, uh, let's say this is the treatment zone is perfect, but look now to the tangential map. And if we look to the tangential map, we see the kind of reverse curve over here. So next to it is, is the point of touch, but it's much clearer to look to the reverse curve, the red circle. And if we see it, and you have to ask yourself the, for the next question, is the centration as expected? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, uh, it depends on the alignment zone you choose. We are working with tangents, but that's a totally different topic uh, I don't cover today. But it depends on the align, alignment zone. You will, can end up with a perfect centration, even when, if, when your treatment zone is a bit off, it's a bit decentered. Your, the fit of your lens could be very much in the center. So in this case, blue is the noise over here. You only focus on the centration, only on the red part. And that's why I, in the, in the, ski, uh, in the slides I show you, is the tangential map co red colored. So you have to focus on the red part. But this, in, in this example, it's okay as well. So if we have a sagittal map, map that's perfect, a tangential map that's perfect, we look in our scheme, oh, it's, it's a bullseye. It's a good fit. Um, it's some it's a fit we cannot improve. We did the, the lens is the behavior of the lens is perfect. Even if our customer is complaining about glare or halos, we don't know what to adjust on the lens, how to solve it. So that's important to understand. So I hope with all the things I explained, things fall into place. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to a poll question. Uh, now it's up to you. I talked a lot already. Uh, now it's up to you. And the poll question is as follows. We see here only one eye, but we see in the superior part, we see um, uh, the, the sagittal map. And in the inferior uh, part of the, of the screen, we see the tangential map. And the question is, where do we have to deal with? Is it a bullseye, central island, a smiley face? Or again, we don't know. So let's go to the, uh, let's go to the poll. I launched the poll right now. Correct answer is A, I already sa said it, it's a bullseye. Well, let's have a look, let's have a look. We have over here, the sagittal map. And this is what I mean previously. And um, do you see the way it is built up with a dark spot? It is blue, more light blue. And do you see how evenly that is? Uh, well, this is this is a, a way you can see, okay, well, probably the fit is perfect. It is your first sign already, but you cannot say the fit is perfect because we need a tangential map as well. Honestly, we first need a tangential map. That, that being said, if we look to this initial map, we see the, the, the steepest part, probably more, most of it in the center, a bit decentrated to, to the temporal side. And that's what we see with our treatment zone as well. So in fact, the, uh, the treatment zone is as expected. If we look to the tangential map it, and we just put a cross in, in, in it, it is perfectly centered. It's perfect. So uh, we have a centration as expected as well. In that case, we just deal with a, a bullseye. There is nothing Fitting wise, you can adjust to make it better for your patient. Yeah, so so imagine that. So I hope this is already uh, much more logical right now with the information I give you previously. But two weeks ago, when we finished our webinar about topography, there was a question about okay, what to do if you have an over refraction with ortho K. And I was uh, I promised I will come back to it. So let's get this this example and say okay, we have to deal with the bullseye. But this is the situation in practice. We have an initial refraction of minus four with a seal of um, uh, 0.5, but we see that back in in our uh, in in our curvature as well. Uh, but the patient is coming back after, after three weeks, but we still end up with an over refraction of minus one diopter. So we end up with a bullseye. The question now is, what do you do with this situation? What, 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 how do you solve it? So we still end up with, with a minus one diopter. So again, the poor question is um, uh, the following. This is the situation I showed you previously. The over refraction after three weeks is minus one. Too much. We have to. We have to solve that. But how do we solve it? Is it answer A? 
we give a central island response. If we say B, we give a central island response and we give a minus one extra power. If we say, to say okay, C, it is okay, we have a bullseye response because we have to deal with a bullseye, or is it bad? Well, okay, we have a D, we have a bullseye response, but we need minus one extra power extra. Or do you say, okay, it's E, and um, we need a, a bullseye response with minus 1.5 diopter extra power. And the question is, what would you choose? So let me pull up the pool. Be what I should do in practice, the correct answer is A, I would give a central island response. And that's confusing. That, that, that's, that's, I can imagine that's confusing at all, but let me explain you this. And this is the last part I will explain, and then this webinar will be over. So um, um, let me explain it. So let me explain you why. For me, it's important that I understand in, when I'm working in practice, why do I, am I doing things? If I understand why, I can explain my patient it better, and I'm a reliable practitioner for myself. And um, if my patient understands why am I doing things, um, uh, and they get it, um, um, I can afford a bit of mistake sometimes, because they, don't, they understand where we are coming from. Yeah? So again, a central island response. This is the situation. This is what I already mentioned. This is the fit. Let's say the point of touch is in the periphery, and we are aiming for a 10 micron distance between the back side of the lens and the front side of the cornea. Um, we know, just from literature and from scientific reasons, if we want to have an ortho K effect, we need, we have to go under the 20 micron distance, under the 20 micron distance to have uh, an ortho K effect. If we go over the 20 microns, uh, we can do what we want, but the ortho K effect is gone. It's not there. So if we want an ortho K effect, we have to go under the 20 microns. That being said, the closer we can get to the cornea, the higher you can correct and the faster you will correct. One thing in common, it have to be stay, we have, have to be a safe system. So you don't want to press at the cornea immediately because we end up with staining and staining uh, can cause other problems. And we want to keep ortho K as a safe system. So from a uh, manufacturer point of view, we are uh, willing that, that you will fit a safe system. And that's why we are aiming for 10 micron distance. But this is the situation. If we calculate the lens and we want to say to, uh, to, to correct it for minus four diopters. And if we know the rule of thumb, every 0.05 millimeter um, flat base curve represent a quarter of diopter. We know if we want to correct minus four diopter, the lens, the base curve of the lens is already flatter, 0.8 flatter than the flattest meridian. So in fact, the minus four base curve is already there. But we end up with our overfraction that we still have one diopter left. But in fact, the lens is already uh, corrected for minus four. So th 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 there is no reason to uh, even make the lens more flatter because it is already corrected for minus four. What is actually happening? What is happening in practice? This is your situation. This is your starting point. This is your starting point. But what will happen uh, over time, because we are creating an ortho K effect, the, um, the, the lens, the, 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 the distance will become larger because the cornea will flatten over time. So the distance will become larger. And in the higher powers, let's say around the above the minus 3.5, then you will see happening these, these problems uh, quite often. Uh, we across the 20 microns barrier. So we are losing ortho K effect. So we can do in the center what we like. We can flatten the base curve, blah, blah, blah. But if at the moment we still have up above the 20 microns, we are, we are, in fact, we are doing nothing. So in case, from a fitting perspective, we have to deal with a bullseye, but skip the term, terminology bullseye. We have to deal with a good fit. But the problem is a bit different. We, the, the, the sagittal height become too high over time because we want to correct a higher, a, a higher myo. I hope you are uh, still following me. So what we are doing at the moment, we give a central island. In fact, we're saying the fit is too steep, the height is too high. We lower the sagittal height of the lens. That's what we want to do. And then we are go going 
under the 20 micron barrier again, and then we have back our auto case uh, effect, and then the, the, the base curve can do its job because it was already corrected for minus four. I hope this everyone gets it and where I'm coming from. So uh, this is the reason, understand what the response does to the lens design. And what I think, um, uh, and this is my personal opinion, by the way, I think with the use of all those terminology like smiley face bulls, eye central island, we overcomplicate things uh, and we make things more difficult uh, for ourselves. Stop using this terminology because if we see a bullseye, sometimes you want to just lower the sagittal height and don't want to give a bullseye response. So if we are forced, if we are still using this terminology, we have the feeling, oh, I have a bullseye, so I have to to uh, give a bullseye response as well. No, no. So, but if we stop with this terminology, we can just look to the lenses where, how, the way we look to gp lenses soft lenses as well we make our life simpler yeah so that being said understand what the response does to the lens design and another thing is when it feels illogical it is often illogical if you want to buy a new camera uh, and, and a very professional camera uh, on ebay for maybe a hundred dollars it's it's it sounds too good to be true, but most of the time it is too good to be true. The same with ortho K. If you have already a bullseye and, and if you have already a good fit, but you have still one day up the left, it makes no sense to, to just simply um, 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 uh, flatten the base curve minus one day up the you have You have to get your answer somewhere else. This is information your uh, subsidiary uh, overseas can help you with with this problem. So if you encounter these kind of problems, we are happy to look with to look along with you and um, uh, to, to to help you with these kind of kind of things. Uh, why did I show you this uh, this example? This last example. Point one, I promised, and point two, it is something you will see very common in your practice. So this is a small tip. Uh, you can solve a lot of issues already in your lens practice. For now. Um, my webinar is over, so I think I give the word back to Corinne. Uh, for my part, uh, it was a pleasure to give this lecture. Uh, maybe in, in, in a couple of months we can do a second session with, with more uh, uh, um, difficult examples. But for now, it is important that you have the, ba have the basic, and I hope that it gave you a better understanding of the, of the basics. Yeah. So now it's word for Corinne. Thank you, Zenda. Just give me a minute to actually set up my slides. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Actually, we have really a lot of questions. In fact, um, I have benefited a lot from this session. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. And then, uh, in fact, you have probably answered the questions from the previous webinar. Okay, but I just put it in here, actually, just for you to have a look. So it's actually discussing about the um, adjustment to the set high and etc. And I also have a question from this round, okay, asking about the same thing. So um, would it be possible for you to just give us a quick summary of what you have suggested? Um, okay, well, let, let me say, say the question. Easy fit usually recommended to flatten the base curve. Uh, depends on what, for residual power, yes. If the, if the amount is small, we will do that, yeah. Um, which cause a loose fit? I don't agree. Uh, why should, should we adjust manually? Well, honestly, I won't do it because we have to deal. And now I, I talk specifically about the C9 lens. We talk about the, the easy fit. And that's something I didn't cover during this webinar because I just it is just general ortho K information I like to, sh uh, I like to share. But um, now we're talking specifically for the C9 lens. So let me get, get into that. The C9 lens is a lens based on tangents and based on heights. And it is an unlinked system. System. It's a very sophisticated lens. It, it, from, from my perspective, um, the way we have to fit lenses, that's why I really believe in this in, in this fitting philosophy from where you way out from, from the outside to the inside. So at the moment, your tangents or your alignment zone is already correct. You can do in the center what you like and it won't affect the fit. So if you flatten the base curve residue power, it won't affect your peripheral fit. So it won't cause a loose fit. It's if you if you end up with a loose fit, probably you had a loose fit beforehand. You had to solve it first before you adjust the power. Make sense? What I try to explain. So mm -hmm. 
the other way around. We are really focused first on the treatment zone and then on the tangential zone. So we, in that way, and I, I, I agree and I can imagine that we all think that the, that the sagittal and the center area is the most important because our patient, that's what I, what, what our customer experience, if you're looking clearly, yes or no, but in fact, we as specialists have to stay step back and first make sure the alignment zone has to be perfect no matter what the patient says if the alignment zone is correct then we can really help the patient make sense uh -huh. yeah yeah it does makes a lot of sense all right yeah. so allow me to move off to our next question and what is the maximum target power for the auto key lenses Depends. Um, honestly, we are suggesting around a minus four, minus 4.5. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to calculate with um, spectacles and calculate it back, you have to uh, around not across the minus five diopters. Uh, and th that's that's a part I didn't cover today because we can do it for next session why we are doing that. And that's everything to do to deal with success rate. And uh, what what happens if you go for high myopes? I won't say that 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 in, instead the C night or uh, every other can can go higher, um, but you want good results. And uh, if when you across the, uh, the, the 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 border, the the the, the limits of minus four minus four point five diopter, um, you will encounter problems in every ortho K lens. Your success rate will drop, and you you have to realize it so this is why we suggest don't across the border of minus four minus minus 4.5 just to to prevent uh, that we end up with problems but that's something we can cover in the next session as well but this is a small answer short answer up to our next question and this is actually a case okay of yeah. eight years of patient with irregular astigmatism and an initial refraction of minus 375 uh, minus one with axis of 180 the topo map show good centration, but after more than one and a half year of treatment, over refraction is still a negative minus one to five diopters. So it's, uh, it's not even reduced to less, less than minus one. So asking well, for advice. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's you can two two way answer. Um, it could be that that is exactly the, the part I explained in my in my example. If you still have your over refraction, yeah, so you have to give a central island response to to get lower to the cornea. That could be the case, but you have a young child so uh, a kind of myopia progression is also involved and uh, that's a different approach it's a totally different topic to discuss that we do right now so what i suggest to do if it is still minus 1.25 i assume that uh, the power was there from the beginning i should say okay lower the sexual height so moving off to our next question what is the highest myopia power that the lens can correct I already I already answered that, but that that's mm -hmm. very subjective. I mean, and that's that's the problem we face. And now I, I talk a bit general. And and again, what I give you um, is, is really my personal opinion. There are um, there are a lot of cowboys out there. Uh, there are they say okay, but we we can correct plus powers. We can correct um, uh, minus ten. Uh, all that kind of. And I, I will believe that. But we have to look mainstream and. Mm -hmm. um, and is the patient really satisfied with that? If if I, we have one example where what we can correct, can correct minus seven diopters, it won't say it will happen for someone else. M the majority is not, and that's the whole problem that we have um, um, with, with, with what what we deal with uh, as practitioners. Honestly, I as practitioner as well. If I if if a new lens comes out, let's say um, uh, we are very in the Netherlands, we are very keen at the moment at customized soft lenses, and if I if I see all the uh, parameters they can produce they can uh, they can make cylinders of minus 12 in a soft toric lens perfect but they can manufacture it but we have to is it actually working in our practice and that's the mind shift we have to make so if we see things on sheets the manufacturer most of the manufacturers showing us only um, what they can produce but producing is not a problem we want a high success rate if I have a patient in my chair with who of you guys, who of you guys in practice fit a soft toric lens successfully with a cylinder of minus 12? Honestly, I, I never did. I never had someone in my store. But, so we have to understand what is going on. It's not what, 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 the, what the manufacturer tells us, this is what we can produce. No, we have to look at it more clinically. Okay, fun, fine that you can manufacture that, but what is reasonable, what is acceptable in, in our practice? And then we see if we if compare it to soft lenses, toric lenses, we end up with minus four diopters, and then we 
we have a very low success rate. And we have to encounter that with ortho K as well. I, I, under, I completely understand that we all love to correct higher, higher, higher myopes. That, that's, that's what we want. And especially, uh, it sounds rude, but especially in the Asian world, we have to deal with higher myopes. So it would be great if we have a lens to correct minus eight. Perfect. But now, the, so there will always be a manufacturer who say, okay, we, 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 can, we can do that for you. Yeah, you can manufacture it. But is the patient at the end successful? And that's the big difference we have to understand. So uh, moving on from our last question, how do you know the central tail thickness is actually less than 20 microns? Um, yeah, well, honestly, we, d we don't know. Let, let's, let, let's, let's be honest about this. Uh, we know from research and, and, and scientific that we are aiming around the 20 microns. And again, uh, it is a, on a personal uh, subjective. So for one person, it will be 22 microns and one 18, 18 microns. Um, then there is another thing what, what creates noise. We all have to deal with topographers. And uh, mm -hmm. every topographer is not so... Uh, one topography is more stable than the other one. So there is fluctuation in your measurement. So if you do what I suggest you to do, four measurements per eye, what I suggest in the webinar two, two, two weeks ago, in these four measurements, there will be differences. So um, because your, your topographer you, is, is just measuring the tear layer, it's different in every blink, it's in, the software behind, uh, uh, well, in the, in, the, in the topography as well, is different. So you end up with, with, with uh, a lot of noise on, on, around, around, yeah, along the road. So um, we know we have to aim around, around the 20 microns. We are only working, and again, I'm now talking for as a manufacturer, we are only working with topographers who are reliable and, and in a certain variation that we say, okay, we are around 10 microns. Uh, but actually measuring it uh, no it's it's a kind of assumption but if the ortho k lens is working okay if we know and that's why i said okay if you have above the minus 3.5 correction and you end up with an over fraction of uh, one diopter or more lower your height because it is definitely an 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 uh, an, an height problem uh, if you are around the minus one please keep giving uh, bullseye responses with your over fraction so this this is yeah Yes. I said thank you. I will shut down my camera and my, and my mic. So again, thank you. Bye-bye.